Muslim Uyghurs made headlines this summer after hundreds were killed in riots in the province of Xinjiang. Thousands were also injured and even more were arrested by Chinese government forces. During the government crackdown, the internet, including social networking sites such as Facebook and texting services on mobile phones, were blocked. While the United Nations called the violence a major tragedy and human rights groups expressed outrage over the persecution of the Uyghurs, the world's leaders remained silent. Yet the crisis was so great it forced China's president to cut short his stay at the G8 summit in Italy. TV footage showed riot police and young Chinese men from the Han community armed with steel pipes and meat cleavers rampaging through the streets. The ugly scenes highlight how far the Communist Party is from its aim of creating a harmonious society. As the tensions continue to rise, China's Uyghurs are looking for powerful friends in high places. But even U.S. President Barack Obama is reluctant to be too critical of China over the questionable treatment of its ethnic minorities. Observers say the world's most powerful man is hardly in a position to defend the Uyghurs' human rights. China holds more than $800 billion in U.S. government-backed debt. And as the U.S. budget deficit tops $1.5 trillion and unemployment climbs towards double digits, the U.S. must find a way to coexist with China or else risk economic catastrophe. China people very happy. Today's agenda asks the question, Why? China, who will dare stand up for the Uyghurs? Press TV says it gives a voice to the voiceless, and today's show is a classic example of that boast. This agenda shines a light on the Uyghur community. Few people had heard of them until the recent eruption of violence in a province China calls Xinjiang, although Uyghurs prefer to call the region East Turkestan. Xinjiang is a rugged region three times the size of Texas with deserts, mountains, and the promise of huge oil and natural gas reserves. It is also the homeland for nine million Uyghurs who want independence. My first guest is no stranger to the region. He is Dr. Enver Bugda from the Uyghur UK Association and now living in the UK. Joining him is Dr. Frank Piquet, a lecturer in modern politics and the Society of China at Oxford University. An accomplished author, his latest book, The Good Communist, examines the structure of today's China, its political elite and changing composition. He says Central Asia has evolved from a marginal region in the 90s to a central theater of international politics, pitting Russia, the US and China against each other in the context of a rising tide of Islamic fundamentalism. As a result, Xinjiang separatism is no longer the minor irritant to the Chinese authorities that it once was. Next to him is another distinguished academic and author, Dr. Jenny Clegg from Central Lancashire University, who was also a lifelong friend of China and an anti-imperialist. Her latest book, China's Global Strategy, represents a serious attempt to grapple with vital issues which concern the country's development. She supports China's disputed claims of sovereignty. Rahima Mehmoud has different views, which is hardly surprising because she was a teacher in the region before she came to the UK to study. She is also a member of Britain's Uyghur community. But before we start the discussion, let's open with the leader in exile of the Uyghurs, Rabia Kadir, and the struggle she faces as she attempts to embark on a world tour to highlight the plight of her people. Known as the Dragon Fighter, she, says she shares similar aims and politics to another fighter for independence, Tibet's Dalai Lama. Like the Dalai Lama, she is revered by supporters but reviled by the Chinese government. And unlike him, hardly anyone has heard of her. India recently denied a visa to Rabi Kadir, the leader in exile of China's minority Uyghur community. 
Many Indian strategists applauded the decision as Kadir's visits only seemed to cause grief to her would-be hosts. And we know for a fact that for the past decade, the Chinese authorities have been using aggressive propaganda to demonize the Uyghur people as one of the three evils of terrorism, separatism and religious fundamentalism. And especially during and after the Olympics, the Chinese authorities initiated pressures which they called a life and death struggle. And after six decades of Chinese rule, the Uyghur people, as you may well be aware, do not enjoy any kind of political, religious, economic, cultural freedoms. So this became an outburst for the Uyghurs to go to the streets to peacefully protest. Her impending attendance at the Melbourne International Film Festival in Australia prompted Chinese directors to withdraw their films and Chinese hackers to attack the festival website. And in another furious diplomatic spat, Beijing slammed Japan's decision to grant her a visa. Meanwhile, Chinese officials are threatening Ankara over the Turkish Prime Minister's promise to allow Kadir into his country. Dr. Clegg, you appear to have little sympathy for those who are wanting a form of independence, including the Tibetans, the Taiwanese and the Uyghurs. Their civilization can be traced back to 4,000 years. What is it about their claims for independence that you think are invalid? Um, well, uh, first of all, let me uh, say that um, uh, I, I wouldn't support independence. I don't think that an independent East Turkestan would be a viable, stable option. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that there aren't serious grievances and concerns that the Uyghurs have. Of course, they have a fantastic civilization. Uh, their uh, concerns at the moment that they're not sharing in the development gains, uh, gains of the rest of China. Um, I think that um, there are um, uh, legitimate grievances and they have national rights and they, they should, as with other national minorities in China, have greater auth autonomy um, in, in order for China to be uh, stable in the future. Um, I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, it's obviously easy to demonize um, Muslim people as uh, violent terrorists. We should also avoid demonizing, I think, uh, China, which is often represented from the point of view of, uh, you know, of ideas of free liberal democracy as a brutal totalitarian state. I think that China does have um, a, a genuine security concerns. Uh, that part of the world, uh, Xinjiang and uh, Central Asia, has had a fantastic history but has also been uh, unstable uh, in the past. Um, and now, uh, again, uh, Xinjiang, after all, borders on Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, there are NATO troops uh, on China's border. Uh, the US, after 9-11, opened a base in Kyrgyzstan that was much closer to the Chinese border than it ever was to Afghanistan. Uh, there are border disputes with India, which for some reason have recently got tangled up again. China's resolved most of its land border disputes. This remains one outstanding. Uh, so I think that there are concerns of security and stability. Um, of course, China um, has uh, an interest in oil in Xinjiang. Uh, but it's not just that, it's also access to the oil and gas in Central Asia that the, the pipelines would pass across Xinjiang. So China has a vested interest in stability, as I should imagine the uh, Uyghur pe people and other people living in the region have a vested interest well, in stability. Well, let me bring in Dr. Enver. I mean, we've just heard um, from Jenny a, a very good case for China, yeah. actually. Uh, how do, how do you feel that, um, you know, she's saying no right to independence and she's laid out some pretty valid reasons or conv convincing reasons why? Yeah, it is a bit disappointing said, uh, to hear that we, uh, we don't have a right to be independent, independent. but uh, if we, we look at back to our uh, history, and uh, maybe uh, everybody have, has heard that and called it a term called a a great game because our country is sandwiched uh, with the Chinese Empire and the uh, British Empire and the Russian Empire so if we become independent 
then in, there may be many problems. We have to deal with many uh, strong powers. So I think uh, from this point of view, maybe it is not the solution to be independent. But from my point of view, we have as much rights as everybody else have to, to control ourselves, to enjoy uh, our self-freedom, uh, and to be the owner of that land. Not like now, because we are now we are a stranger living in our own land. Well, if I can bring in uh, Dr. Frank, I mean, you make reference to this in your book about um, the strategic sighting of this, uh, this, this province. Yes, well, I, I'm sort of in between these two <laughs> positions, probably, um, although I, I veer a little bit more towards Jenny, actually, I, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, I think that in the 1980s, China actually had a very good, relatively enlightened policy towards its minority populations, of which there were 55. Um, and the Uyghurs were one of those. Um, and that worked because at that time China was still relatively sealed off from the world and these people were living in peripheral areas in China. So China could, through these policies, give substantial rights to these people um, on the basis of essentially uh, a myth that the Han Chinese, the majority, were just one of the nationalities in China and the Uyghurs and other peoples were others. Now, that has changed in the 1990s. First of all, of course, China changed. China became richer, China became more involved with the world, um, but also China's policies internal, internally towards its minorities started changing. Instead of saying that the Han people were just one of these nationalities, suddenly the Han were the dominant or the leading nationality. And I think that was already embarking on a road towards trouble, saying that. In that sense, the Communist Party was voicing a sentiment, of course, amongst the majority of the Chinese population, but something they had steered away from previously at some political cost to itself. And so that is one thing that happened. On the other hand, of course, places like Xinjiang suddenly became, particularly in the last 10 years or so, have become part of areas that previously were peripheral and rather unimportant and could be dealt with um, without spending too much political capital in the international arena. Now suddenly it's become a theater of international politics between the world's superpower, uh, superpowers and rising superpowers. And suddenly you can't deal with the, the Uyghur issue or the Kazakh issue simply from a Chinese standpoint. There are strategic interests involved that heretofore didn't exist. Well, not a great deal is known about the, um, the Uyghur community. And we've got a, a little spot here where we thought we'd give viewers 10 facts that they might not know and um, you know perhaps that you'd care to uh, discuss them um, Frank and we've got these facts coming up now that uh, Uyghurs are a Turkic speaking Muslim people who live primarily in uh, Xinjiang. Um, the flag which is used as the backdrop uh, to this uh, moving graphic we're showing now mm -hmm. apparently that's banned in China it's, mm -hmm. it's not allowed in China um, nine million Uyghurs, about 8.5 of them living in, in that um, province. And politically there's been an independence movement since 1933 to create a new sovereign state. Uh, Rahima, are you a little disappointed, you know, as we're looking at these statistics by the reactions that you've heard so far? Well, um I am not surprised of the, of the, the comments about um, what uh, two uh, specialists uh, just made. Um, independence is uh, its ideology. Now, of course, for us Uyghurs, uh, like Anwar said, we have as much right as uh, other people uh, that because we are the uh, native people in the land and uh, uh, we should enjoy uh, the independence um, but um, even not to talk about in independence if we talk about the right the human rights in that region it the human right abuse in that region is horrific um, Uyghurs doesn't have very basic rights uh, uh, 
in East Turkestan. When you're touching on human rights, it says uh, in the statistics that the Chinese government often refers to Uyghurs as Islamic terrorists. Um, and, and, you know, why, why would the Chinese government call the, the Uyghur people terrorists? Can I say this? Can. Yes, yeah. of course. <laughs> I think it happened since uh, September 11. So what happened was uh, uh, people around the world just suddenly discovered there is a nation in the uh, remote corner of the world. Why? Because the Chinese said, oh, look, I got a terrorist in my backyard. Before they never said that, before they said, and everybody is harmony, uh, living in the harmony environment. This is in reference to the, the large Muslim community, the Uyghur community. Yes. Why they decide that? I think there are so many reasons for that. One is a strong reason is they want to legitimize the military, heavy military presence in, in Xinjiang. It's not only to prevent that Xinjiang, uh, uh, our people become independent country. I think that they are present as heavy as a military, it is against the uh, uh, United States because the United States wanted to, to step into Central Asia. And then <clears throat> by doing this, they have to have a reason to put so many uh, soldiers into that region. They have to have reason. So that's why. And uh, there's another reason is we are Muslim. And the terrorists in this level, it's very easy to paint it to on our head. I think that's why they decided. Mm. I saw you uh, nodding there, Jenny, um, in, as soon as the Americans were, were mentioned about wanting to get this footprint in Asia. Do you think that this is the, the real reason uh, that perhaps China is adamant it will not let uh, go of the, uh, this East Turkestan province? Uh, I think that it's one of the major reasons, uh, yes, and I, as I said, I think that uh, there's an issue of uh, China's energy, which has become very important. Uh, China started uh, to import uh, oil in the early 1990s, uh, and of course it relies on oil from the Middle East. Most of that oil comes by sea lanes, sea routes, which are controlled by the uh, United States and could be easily cut off if there was a dispute, for example, over Taiwan, the United States could, could cut off. So there is this opportunity to develop the Eurasian link. And of course, the uh, Central Asia is strategically very important because it represents the link between Europe and Asia. And I think in uh, the mid-1990s, uh, the American political analyst, uh, uh, Brzezinski uh, wrote that, uh, you know, there's nothing that the U.S. feared more than being marginalized uh, in Eurasia. And that is what started to happen actually before 9-11, because uh, Russia and China uh, re uh, reached a, 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 a mutual um, uh, peace pact and started to create the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So here was the first time uh, in, uh, you know, two centuries at least that there was an accommodation between countries within the region which had previously spiraled down into conflict and uh, lack of development and poverty. So here was a, a, a real opportunity to start to uh, create some stability and um, uh, start the process of development. Um, and of course the uh, the problems in Afghanistan, the NATO moving into Afghanistan, you know, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, Russia that is concerned about NATO expansion and missile defense. You know, China also has these concerns. But, uh, Frank, I mean, surely uh, China can dictate to America. It's, it, it, you know, it's taken a, a, a massive debt from America, it could easily pull the rug from underneath the, uh, the Americans' feet and make the country bankrupt if it well, wanted. Um, no, it cannot. Um, of course, China's power is rising, and China's been saying that it's been rising for some time now, but it's still not a superpower militarily. Um, and also, economically, it's still well short of the, the level and the standard of the United States. So it can't uh, play the global game with America on an equal footing yet. I mean, that is still another 10 years, 15 years from now. 
Um, so America remains the dominant power in the world, and China knows that and has to play by those rules. But I think the key issue in Xinjiang is that, that as I said earlier, that China's policies towards its minorities date essentially from the 80s, if not before, and they no, now no longer work in a situation where you have massive immigration of Han Chinese in, in Xinjiang, you have massive development, you have huge strategic and international interests suddenly in these areas. So they have to rethink these policies um, to give better guarantees to the rights of these people, but they don't quite know how to do that or what to do, and I think that is the key problem. The one thing I also want to say is that for the CCP, the Communist Party, it's absolutely vital that they hang on to Chinese sovereignty in these areas. If they say to Tibet or Xinjiang or whatever, or, or in Mongolia, you can have far-reaching autonomy or independence, they shoot themselves through the head, essentially. Well, let's just check out this map and find out uh, who are the neighbors in this, uh, in this region. There are about 9 million Uyghurs with approximately 8.5 million of them in Xinjiang. Those that live outside Xinjiang are mostly male traders that live in Chinese cities. Around 400,000 Uyghurs are living outside of China mostly in Central Asian states bordering Xinjiang. There are about 300,000 in Kazakhstan and 50,000 in Kyrgyzstan. There are also communities in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkey and the West, but the numbers are unknown. There are Uyghurs in the United States and Washington, D.C. Enver, what are the neighbours like? Are they friend or foe of the Uyghurs? It is quite a um, difficult un question, to, uh, question to answer because we have a mixed and confused relation with our neighbours. On the, the ground floor, we have no problem with Kazakhs, with the Russians, with the Kyrgyz, with the Pakistanis. We, we looked at each other like brothers and sisters. But on the government level, there's a problem because the um, uh, Chinese government uh, threatening everything that uh, put the, the pressure to those countries. So <clears throat> what the, those countries did? When our uh, countrymen, Uyghur people, they escaped to the neighboring country, they sent them back. Kazakhstan did, Kyrgyzstan did, Pakistan did, and, and then Nepal did. They, they did send them back to the Chinese and they have been persecuted. So that is, and then so it's a bit of a, a mixed picture. Yeah. Well, we're heading towards a break now, but as usual, there's a question. I want to know who said this. I went swimming in the ocean for the first time ever yesterday, and it was the happiest day of my life. Stay tuned for the answer just after the news. Welcome back to today's edition of The Agenda with me, Yvonne Ridley, and studio guests Dr. Enver Bugda, Dr. Frank Piquet, Dr. Jenny Clegg, and Rahima Mahmoud. As we went into a break, I asked who said, I went swimming in the ocean for the first time ever yesterday, and it was the happiest day of my life. These were the words of Uyghur and ex-Guantanamo detainee Saladin Abdullah, aged 32. And now a resident of Bermuda, he and three other Uyghurs arrived on the island a few weeks ago from Guantanamo, but there are still more than a dozen left. China has demanded their repatriation, but the U.S. refuses to on human rights grounds. Jenny, what observations would you make about that? 
Well, I think that the whole question about the Uyghurs at Guantanamo Bay has really brought the Uyghur issue to the forefront of the, at least the Western world. It's drawn a lot of uh, attention. And of course, from China's point of view, I mean, it's a discriminatory and, you know, hypocritical, if you like, uh, action of the United States. I mean, the United States will repatriate uh, people to other, other countries, but not to China. And of course, this kind of reinforces the, the image of China as being a serial human rights uh, abuser. Now, of course, there have been really serious human rights abuses and the, the Chinese government has clamped down uh, very heavily on uh, separatist activism in Xinjiang province and a lot of its actions uh, should not be condoned and should be condemned. I find it quite significant, as I read today in the paper, that China has actually stated that it will now uh, use the death penalty much more sparingly um, I think that China, um, we have to recognize that China is responding and does respond to uh, criticisms of human rights um, uh, uh, from, from outside the world. Amnesty International has, for example, criticized China for the excessive use of the death penalty. Of course, China is not the only country to excessively use well, the death penalty. Well, if I bring Rahima in, because you're concerned about human rights it, um, back home, aren't you? Yes. On, uh, what is it that's really th 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 that upsets you? The most important thing is there is no independent uh, uh, trial, uh, the open fair trial for anyone who is involved in politics, and there is no independent um, investigations. Uh, is that across China as a whole, or is it just in the in the province? For as far as I know, for the uh, political uh, um, political uh, uh, criminals, they, uh, in whole China, it is almost the uh, same policy. But it's more extreme uh, in the provinces, like in like my uh, my part, uh, East Turkestan and Tibet. Um, I witnessed a 97 uprise in, in Golja. Uh, it was very similar uh, uprise like this time. It started very, very peacefully, but the Chinese armed the police opened fire, then turned that uh, very peaceful uh, protest into a riot. Uh, since that evening, they start door-to-door -door arrest. Some family, three sons were arrested. Uh, some family, they, there is even the father and every, everybody all arrested. And many were arrested at the scene. They were people who were doing their own just business. And it took many months for some people being released and when they were taken to hospital, the uh, doctors were scared to treat them just because they involved in politics. Well, I know that Anvil again wants to come in on this. During the break, you were mentioning about uh, how young women from the region were being removed and taken into, uh, well, into other parts of China. What, what is that about? It's, it's happened uh, since 2004, and the first time I saw it, and there was news saying that in Chinese uh, remote southeastern corner, there's a factory, they employed 200 Uyghur girls. And I said, well, this is a very good thing. But later on, we started receiving telephone calls, letters, emails from inside the country. And we have discovered that uh, <clears throat> They are, they are uh, come, come this party, they, they encourage uh, a company to employ uh, Uyghur girls in Xinjiang with one condition, unmarried. And aged between 16 to 25, unmarried, and uh, uh, um, promised them well-paid job and free accommodation, free transportation to the inner China. But in reality, it wasn't happened like that. It happens so bad treatment and the many, they have been forced to go to institutions, and even more of them, they have been encouraged and forced to marry local Chinese. So you're saying this is to dilute the, um, the Uyghur population? Not only that, 
Do you know Chinese one-child policy? One-child policy has produced 50 million more men than women. That is a serious problem for China. But this, of course, they don't openly say that. But we can see there's serious things behind it. Well, uh, Dr. Frank, I know that you were talking about the demographics and you were saying, well, there isn't just 8.5 million mm -hmm. Uyghurs uh, living in that uh, region. Yeah, well, Xinjiang is at the end of the day um, a more or less artificially carved out bit of Central Asia that also includes Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and, and so on. And, and in all these countries, the, the population is ethnically mixed. And so the Kazakhs are also living in Xinjiang, just as there are Uyghurs in Kazakhstan, and so on and so forth. And in that sense, that part of the world is very similar to the Bal Balkans. But in this area that, uh, that Enver calls East Turkestan, in 1955, 74% of the population were Uyghurs, mm -hmm. and now that is 45% with 41% coming from uh, the Han. Uh, sure. Well, that is a different issue, of course, the inflow of Han Chinese migrants from eastern, the eastern part of China. Are the Uyghurs being ethnically cleansed? I don't think the word ethnic cleansing is a little, much too strong. What they are becoming is a minority in their own land. And I think there's not so much a policy of ethnic cleansing, but of marginalizing and, if possible, assimilation of Uyghurs into Han Chinese majority culture, um, which is something that has been very successful in Inner Mongolia and other minority areas of China. It has progressed there much farther uh, already. Um, and I'm sure that policymakers in Beijing use that as a template for Xinjiang. This has been a, a criticism from the Han Enver that uh, the Uyghurs will not assimilate, they won't integrate, and uh, Islam is cited as, uh, as the main stumbling block. <laughs> There's a main difference between the, the character of Han Chinese and the character of Uyghur people. And for example, let me give you one example. Uh, it was, I was working as a surgeon in, in Urumqi. In every uh, New Year, Chinese New Year, we will be invited to our uh, chef of surgeon's house. And she, she always take a plate of sweets and offer others. And she take the one she likes. She thought that it's the best one, give it to me. And I, I, I always take it and put it into my, my pocket. She never knows, what she never knows, that I never eat sweets. And this is, uh, and it is the same in the terms uh, come to our Muslims uh, yet. We invite them come to our house, we give them plates of sweets to offer them whole plates and you took whatever you want. You took the one you like. This is the different behavior. So by saying this, I want to say the things we, do, we really want, they don't want to give us. The things we don't want, they are put into to our head. Well, Johnny Miller uh, wanted to find out more about the Uyghurs, so he went off to London's Chinatown in search of some answers, and this is what he found. Hi there. We're here in London's famous Chinatown to ask the Chinese community what they think about the Uyghurs and indeed why they are being persecuted. Let's find out. You know the Uyghur population, the minority Uyghur population? The Uyghur? Uyghur. Do you know Uyghur. that the minority Muslim population? Oh, you mean that, that, that one, that news on the news? Yeah. Yes. Oh, well. Who's coming down? Yeah, they come down now because of the, you know, the Uyghur in China. You know there's a conflict at the moment happening between the Han Chinese and the Uyghur Muslim minority. Do you know anything about that at all? Um, I don't know. Do you know anything about that, no? No. What population? The Uyghur population. Uyghur population? The Uyghur. Uh, I'm not sure about that, that type of thing. You mean the population of the England? No, the Uyghur population. You know the minority Muslim population in China? I have no idea. You don't know them? I don't know. No, I don't. 
let you know who they are? Uh, no. What's the population? The Uyghur population. Uyghur? Yeah. What's a Uyghur population? So I can't ask that. Well, there we are. It seems the Chinese community in London, anyway, don't seem to know too much about the Uyghurs or their troubles. Maybe you guys back in the studio might be able to shed a little bit more light on it than we can. Back to you, Yvonne. Thanks for that, uh, Johnny. I'm going to go to Jenny now. Um, a few blank faces there. I'm not sure if it, if, if it was our pronunciation of Uyghur. Uh, Again, why is so little known about uh, this region? Um, why is so little known about this region? Um, by whom? <laughs> well, obviously you're well informed and, and you've uh, written copious amounts about it and, and you know, I'm sure it's contained in your book, but uh, the, the general public um, at large, I mean, you know, we've okay. all heard of Russia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, okay. it's okay. all in the news. No, I, just, I just wondered whether you meant in China. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that there was maybe an issue of pronunciation. Right. Uh, I, think that, I think that it's not just a problem that people don't know very much about uh, the Uyghurs uh, in this country. Uh, I don't think that people know very much about China, actually. And so that's why it's easy to kind of view things in very uh, simplistic uh, views. But everyone's uh, heard that that of Tibet a, and the Dalai Lama. Uh, well, they certainly have. And mm -hmm. now, of course, the uh, leader of the World uh, Uyghur Congress has uh, linked herself with the, the Dalai Lama, and the Dalai Lama has written the preface to her autobiography. Um, and uh, now uh, Western governments have uh, been attending the World Uyghur Con Congress. It's uh, uh, European, Australia and so on and uh, the World Uyghur Con Congress I think has got support from the National, uh, uh, in da um, uh, the National um, Democracy Foundation uh, in the United States. But it's still um, a struggle. So um, there is, you know, the, the Indian um, government has refused a, vi a visa to uh, to this woman and um, Japan has certainly been uh, politically uh, hauled over the coals by China for giving her a visa. The Melbourne Film Festival, all the Chinese uh, directors have withdrawn their movies from the festival because she was going to attend there. So there's a lot of pressure from the Chinese government not to let this story get out. I think that that goes back to what I was saying at the beginning about these questions of security and, uh, and stability. Uh, I'm the, uh, uh, I believe that the World uh, Uyghur Congress is getting funding from uh, the United States, from organizations that have been very much involved in supporting color revolutions. Um, I think that r right at the very beginning uh, that uh, there, there need to, needed to be a corrective because um, we don't want to play a numbers game, but a lot of uh, reports will say that, uh, you know, there were a lot of Han Chinese uh, that lost their lives. Um, um, so uh, clearly there, is, there are, you know, there are I issues here as well that ch the Chinese government has, has its concerns, the Han Chinese have, have their concerns as well. I mean, I'd also like to go back and say, you know, on this question of ethnic cleansing, um, the one child family policy, of course, it doesn't apply to uh, uh, national minorities. If the Chinese government wanted to ethnically cleanse, uh, why would it discriminate actually against the majority Han Chinese and allow the national minorities to have more well, children. Well, that's an interesting point, Rahima. So the Uyghurs didn't have to adhere to this one-child policy. Well, Uyghurs, if you look at the population of Uyghurs, they claim it's about 9 million, but we, we also believe maybe even more than that, far more, or maybe about 15 million. But even if we say 20 million compared to 1.3 billion Chinese, and if you apply the same policy to East Turkestan, that can be very ridiculous. Um, also, in East Turkestan, there are places, uh, very, very poor places, like Khoten and a very remote part of 
Kashkar, for example, that there are still uh, the, ch the children, you, know, you can't guarantee that they, they can uh, survive. Because there are still have a lot of places, very deprived, deprived places. Uh, so now we can have two children. Two children still for the such minority is not enough. We, we believe it shouldn't be restricted, uh, you know, if we could afford uh, to, uh, to have children. But in fact now, even if the uh, Chinese government uh, encourage the Uyghurs to have more children, they can't afford. Simply, the in unemployment uh, rate is very, 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 very high, and there is no social security if you don't have job in the in the government. There is no health uh, health care. Well, I know Frank wants to come in at this. Well, I just want stage. to reinforce what you were saying from a local perspective. I think already very eloquently. I think and I think I've made that obvious uh, during the last 45 minutes or so, that I don't think an independence for East Turkestan is the solution to any of the problems. I really think the solution is in making sure that the Chinese government forces local Chinese in Xinjiang and the local government to allow Uyghurs and other minorities to share more in the fruits of economic development locally. I think that's the key thing. The key thing is unemployment, access to education, uh, access to land and so on and so forth. That is really the issue. And if you say independence for Xinjiang is a solution, I think you're doing exactly the opposite. You're creating a powder keg, you're creating an international problem and you make the situation worse. You may destabilize China, but with that you're creating a huge international problem that is not going to go away for the next 25 years. What would the problem be if East Turkestan, if, if China said, okay, go on your own, you're on your own now, what do you think would happen? The area is, we're told, oil rich. It has resources. It could stand on its own two feet. I think the key thing that would happen from the Chinese Communist Party's point of view, which I think is quite, imp quite an important point of view, is that uh, they will lose forever the right to rule China with that because they will, in the eyes of all Chinese people, have violated national integrity. That and its right to rule at the moment it hinges very much on its ability to build up a strong China that is within secure borders as defined essentially by the old empire, the Qing Empire. If they waver even for a, a, a millimeter from that, then I think the Chinese Communist Party can no longer legitimately rule China. And I don't think any international power, including the United States, would want to be in a situation where China becomes unstable. I think we all have a vested interest in a strong, prosperous and, prosperous and stable China. We may not like the Communist Party, we may not like communism, we may not like many of the things they, they do, but I think the alternative is infinitely worse. Enver, infinitely worse, independence? <coughs> And uh, Dr. Frank said that uh, um, the world cannot afford a instable China. And uh, I don't know if you look at the Chinese Communist Party's history. The Communist regime, they took power by making this country unstable. And the, the way they are ruling this country, it is making this country problem. It is creating a problem, then uh, crack it down to stabilize their power. So many uh, scholars argue that the uh, Chinese central government, they can't afford the chaos in, in the situation in, uh, within China. I disagree with that. If everywhere is peace, everybody living happily, then everybody will think something else. But you're in one of the most volatile regions yeah. of the world. You've got Afghanistan and Pakistan and all the turmoil that is going there. I think if in terms of Chinese, okay, we can't afford you, you go, you, you live by your own, I think then we, will, we might see a Russian Red Army coming from the north, or American Army from the Afghanistan, or somebody else coming to us. Well, leaving on that amazing scenario, mm. uh, our time is up. I'm sure that the debate will continue.
But um, I would like to know what you think of today's show and what's your view about the Uyghurs. Here's Lauren Gunnius to tell you how to make your voice heard on the agenda. Hello. The plight of the Uyghurs has touched a few raw nerves among our global Facebook fans, especially with New Yorker Battery Jackson, who has several reasons for the international apathy. He wrote, there's nothing that will stop China's experiment because China's style of government is so controlled and repressive, with the ideal that citizens are worthless peons undeserving of rights. The Chinese government is evil and is good for absolutely no one, except the CCP members themselves. And fellow American Gohar Baig from Michigan observed, the Western media has not been interested for a long time. On the other hand, the majority of Muslim media is ran by, by liberal fascist dudes. And Canadian Zainab Mustafar from Toronto says, the Chinese government has long been suspicious and bitter toward the Muslim minority in its country. The Uyghurs are seeing their culture being obliterated by the central Chinese government for two reasons. First, they are looked upon as separists. And secondly, in the post 9-11 era, in order to earn the good pleasure of the White House, the Uyghurs have conveniently been placed into the terrorist block. She continues, the West could care less because the Uyghurs are not Buddhists like the Tibetans. If only the world found them as cuddly as the Dalai Lama, celebrities would by now have already planned a dozen events to raise money for their suffering. If the Uyghurs were Buddhists, the U.S. State Department would have issued strong words of warning to Beijing. But the Uyghurs aren't Buddhists. Instead, they are Muslims. And Muslims don't get much love these days. It's as simple as that. Thus, the Uyghurs are the wrong kind of minority. Well, that's all we have time for today. So if you would also like to be in touch, then please send your emails to the agenda at PressTV.com. You can also contact us on Facebook or text us at plus four four seven eight zero 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 eight zero eight six. If you would like to watch a past show, simply go to our website at www.PressTV.com. Once there, click on the programs icon, then click on the agenda panel, and there's a selection of past shows for you to choose from. Thank you for watching, and back to you in the studio. Well, that just remains for me to say a very big thank you to each and every one of our guests, and we'll see you all soon on the next agenda.